بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين محمد الأمين أما بعد سو فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال أز وجل في محكم التنزيل ألف لام ميم غلبت الروم في أدنى الأرض وهم من بعد غلبهم سيغلبون في بضع سنين لله الأمر من قبل ومن بعد ويومئذ يفره المؤمنون بنصر الله من ينصر من يشاء وهو العزيز الرحيم So today I have I would say in some ways more important things to say today uh, maybe more relevant things to say today than I did yesterday Before we begin, let's look at this, these verses of the Qur'an. And uh, then after that, we'll actually look at exactly what is happening on the ground. Uh, and then you'll see where this is going to, inshallah, how it's going to uh, go. So Allah says, Alif Lam Mim. One of the points that we can make about Alif Lam Mim that is important to the conversation we're having right now is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses alif lam mim in any of the surahs so the surahs that start with alif lam mim alif lam mim alif lam mim they have something in common they have something in common so that's one of the reasons Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is starting a surah with alif lam mim ghulibat al rum the romans have been defeated, Allah said. When did Allah say this? Allah said this when Muslims were weak. And the superpowers of the world, the Persians and the Roman, Romans were at each other's necks. What were they fighting for? Partly Rome was fighting, the Orthodox Rome was fighting for Jerusalem. This will become relevant as we discuss some of the issues. Alif Lam Mim Ghulibat al Rum fi Adna al Ard. In a place in a land nearby or in that part of the earth that has the lowest, uh, is lower than the sea level, the lowest place on earth. Both meanings are correct. And after their defeat, they're going to be uh, victorious. In just a few years. For Allah is the affair. It's Allah's will. Before, and after. This I want to point out what I'm trying to going to emphasize in this introduction to this talk is these words of Allah, لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ بَعْدُ For Allah is the affair before, in the past, and ba'du, and in the future. And then it is, وَيَوْمَ إِذِينَ يَفْرَهُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And on that day, the believers will rejoice. Meaning, before, a day before, and a day after. Something in the past, Something in the future, the believers will rejoice. What will the believers rejoice? The victory of the Romans. Why will the believers rejoice on the victories of the believers? A few reasons. Bi nasrillah, by the support of Allah. Yansuru man yasha. Allah helps whoever He wants. Wa huwa al azizur rahim. He is the one who has authority and he's the most merciful. Wa'adullah is the promise of Allah. He'll keep his promise. One reason to celebrate is when Allah keeps his promises. And you see that Allah has kept his promise. And that help came from the place where you did not expect, where Allah promised it would come. Wa'adullah la wa'ada. And Allah doesn't break his promise. 
ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون. But majority of the people they don't see this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep his promises and things will pan out as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has foretold us. The question that we will ponder upon first before we talk about some interesting stuff is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the believers to rejoice over the victory of some non-believers. I want you to think about this and think about our attitudes today. If somebody said today, well, we should rejoice over the victory of such and such non-Muslim group, we might not get it. But when you look at the bigger plan of things, that how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unfolding the events to make his promises come true, to show people the sign that things will unfold in the direction that Allah wants. Number one, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may do this with whomever he wills. In Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions for the people that were not Muslims, who conquered Bani Israel because of their disobedience to Allah. Let me show you the verse actually. And this will become relevant in the context of that no one comes in the way of Allah in his plans. And I don't think I will be wrong in saying that right now, uh, in a metaphorical way, Muslims are coming in the way of Allah against his plans. So in Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions In ayah number five, when the first of those promises come, that they would be destroyed from the Assyrians, Bani Israel, when the Assyrians come from the north, just like the Crusaders came from the north for the Muslim Ummah, or the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the same way the Assyrians came from the north against the Ummah of Prophet Musa. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ أُولَاهُمَا بَعَثْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ إِبَادًا لَنَا We sent against you our servants. We sent against you our servants. Now, the Assyrians were not Muslims. The people that were being sent, the army was sent against, they were Muslims. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ أُولَاهُمَا When the first of those promises comes, you will see what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling the disbelievers ibadan lana our servants uli ba'sin shadid with great power they have fajasu khilal al-diyar and they'll even enter into your houses wa kana wa'dan maf'ula this is a promise of Allah again promise is mentioned meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need you you need him and Allah will complete his promises and his tasks and his, his plan will be completed whether you're part of it or you're not part of it. This is also the threat given in a different way in Surah Al-Muhammad, the last verse of Surah Al-Muhammad. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let me show you. فَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِ الْقَوْمَ غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُ أَمْثَالَكُمْ Here Allah says, you're being called to spend in the cause of Allah. But there are some amongst you, they're selfish. They don't want to spend in the cause of Allah. The one who is selfish is selfish against his own self. Allah is self-sufficient. He doesn't need you. 
Wa antumul fuqara. You need Allah. You're faqir for him. You're helpless before him. What? If you don't do, if you don't obey the Prophet, and if you turn your backs, Allah will bring another people other than you to do his task. And they will not be like you. I'll end this example with the example of uh, Chinggis Khan. Okay? Chinggis Khan, when he came to Baghdad and conquered the Muslims, he brought all the Muslims to the what was called the Eidgah, the place of Eid, he gathered all the Muslims there. He said, you know why I came? You know why I came? And then he said, I came as a punishment of God upon you. I came as a punishment of God upon you. So, likewise, the story continues. The Sunnah of Allah didn't change. And in fact, this is this very surah that mentions to Isra. The Sunnah of Allah doesn't change. The plan of Allah continues whether the believers are part of it or not. And so it's very important to understand, therefore, what is the plan of Allah? What does Allah want? Where do we stand in history? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expect us to do at this point and in this junction of history? And so the Prophet was told the Romans have been defeated. And this is one very important point that the Prophet from the very beginning had a soft spot in his heart for the Christians. And they were closer to Islam. And so, even though they were disbelievers, but they were still closer. Hence, the term Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul Kitab are not Muslims. They're Kafirs. But because there's some closeness, it, when the Prophet is in Mecca, what does the word Quran use? For the people in Mecca. Ya qawm, oh people. O oh, qawmi, oh my people. That was the common bond, the family bond of being Quraysh, being Hashemiyah that he had, and that's how he addressed the people. Oh my people. When he was in Medina, he was dealing with the Jews. What's the common bond he has with the people of Medina? They're not Muslims. They're Ahlul Kitab. The Quran calls them the people of the book. Ya Ahl al-Kitab, lastum ala shay. O people of the book, you have no claim. Hatta tuqimu tawrata wal injil Until you yourself establish Tawrat and Injil. And so in Medina, the Prophet is sitting there telling the Jews, you better apply your own book. We will be the first ones to tell you that you apply your book on yourselves if you're true to your belief. That's what Islam does. Recall the time where the Prophet said, okay, bring the Torah to me, read it to me. And he applied the punishment of Torah upon the Jews of Medina. Killed some of the treacherous leaders and let, expelled the others. You remember this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in the Quran that yawma idhin yafrahu, and this word faraha, faraha, generally is a very negative term in Quran, but is being used positively here because it means to be overly happy. One is to be happy. The other is to be overly happy. Yawma idhin yafrahu al-mu'minun. On that day, the believers will be overly happy because that was the day of Badr and then the victory of the Romans. According to some of the narrations. But... In the Quran itself, it's only mentioning this. On that day when the Romans defeat the Persians, the believers will be happy. Overly happy. Very happy. Even though they're not Muslims. So this is a very important point to understand the Sunnah of Allah. If Muslims are not doing their job, if Muslims don't have Khilafah, if Muslims are not doing what they're supposed to do, does the work of Allah stop? Does Allah need me or you or the Muslim Ummah to continue the work of Islam? 
or to bring about the world order as Allah sees it? No. So now, having understood this, now let us proceed to my second point today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and then after this, I'm going to talk about Putin and what he's done with the Muslims in Russia, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You will definitely find this is lam for the people who know Arabic language, lam tashdeed, noon tashdeed with you will definitely find in the future the most severe amongst mankind in hatred in enmity basically having the Iblisi attitude towards Muslims we are better than you for the people who really believe al Yahud. Now it is so interesting here, it is so interesting, it is so interesting from a grammatical perspective. I wonder how many people would catch on to this, but it doesn't say Yahud, it says Al-Yahud. And those who do shirk. And you will definitely find in the future the most closest to you in mawadda, in love and affection, like family members. To the people who believe. Those who say, We are Christians. That's their identity. And Nasara means helpers. So what are the helpers? So I'm gonna, if I remember, I'm gonna talk about that. Why Nasara? This is because amongst them are priests who tell them to be humble, who give them anyhow good advice. And they have the monks amongst them. And they are not a proud people. Okay? If you find Christians who are proud, I can give you an example of John Hagee and Billy Graham and so many other evangelical Christians in America, preachers who make tall claims and this and that. And, but these people, they're not, they don't have, they don't have takabbur. They definitely don't represent Iblis because Iblis's number one symbol internally is his takabur. Aba was takbar. So they're not amongst them. But when the believers will find that the most harshest against them are those who are Jews and those who make partners to Allah. Now, let's stop here for a second, because when I talk about Russia and when I talk about Putin, once this point is clear, everything, a lot of things will become clear. Why will in the future the Jews and the Mushrikeen be harsh on the Muslims? Hmm. Because the Quran says, you will be most high if you are truly believers. The Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you are truly believers, Allah is saying, if you're truly believers like Abu Bakr and Umar, Islam will rise, there's no fear. Islam will become strong. So wait, why is Allah saying in the future you will find the Jews and the idol worshippers most severest against you? Is it because Muslims will be weak? 
Is it because they will not be holding on to their deen? And because they will not be holding on to their deen, then they will have, a, they will, they will be used by Allah to punish the Muslims. But they will become enemies of the Muslims and will be able to show their enmity against the Muslims. And that is the specific meaning of the word that is used here. Adawatun. Baghdad and Adawatun. There's something in the heart that's already there and now it manifests itself. For the people that know Arabic language will know Baghda and Hadawatun. Anyway, so now let us look at what has happened in Russia. Okay. And so I'm going to maybe not be completely coherent, but I'm going to try to make it as coherent because there's a, a lot of things I want to share with you. But I wanted to share these verses of Quran so that when you're looking at, and this is what we're supposed to do, everything we look at. We're supposed to look at it from a Quranic point of view. So now when I show you certain things, you'll be able to see that through the nur of the Quran. Okay, I get it. Right? So let's inshallah ta'ala start from point number. Uh, let's start with point number uh, one. <clears throat> Let me start here. Uh, this is the mus. Uh, let me uh, make sure I turn on the audio before I do this. Yeah. This is the brother who is in charge of Chechnya. He's in charge of the Chechnyan battalion. And in order to understand how well thought out how well thought out Putin's strategy was he, there's a reason he put the Muslims in the front because he's showing the West that you tried to create a proxy war against me but now these people are my friends and they're the ones that are going to take over the capital it's the Chechnyan Muslims and their experience before that in Syria, because Russia or Putin used Chechnyan Muslim against ISIS. Okay, and now he's bringing them back in the forefront to show Europe that, look, these people that you turned against me, today they're working with me. To, to show you how well thought out and detailed his thinking and process, and he took his time because I'll, I'll show you other things too. So, so you kind of get an idea of how well-timed this was. So this is the man, the Muslim brother who is... So if you look here, Putin appoints Ramzan Kadava as acting head of Chechnya. This is the guy who is leading the people in Salah and give, he gave the Adhan and he led. Oh, wait. Uh, let me see if I can do this here. This is the, this is the brother who is uh, he gave the Adhan and then he had one of the elders lead prayers. This is the army that is actually going to take over the capital of Ukraine. These were the same people who at one time were fighting against Putin. And today he has them in the front line to show the world that you use these people against me, but now I have made them my friends. And perhaps he's trying to say something more than that, but I can't say what else I do know on the subject. So you can see these pictures.
Okay, let's continue now. Talking about his his um, well thought out strategy. He's also made sure that the timing is such that especially Europe, and this is why they've not been able to take any strong action. They've not been able to take strong action. Why? They've not been able to take strong action because uh, they are in an energy crisis. What happens if Russia cuts off Europe's natural gas? How Europe is trying to deal with its gas crisis? Does it want to make it worse? Why is there an energy crisis in Europe? And uh, we will talk about Turkey in a little bit later. Okay, so this was only to point out that this is not something he thought of maybe a few days or a few months. This was something that was thought of, thought of and relationships he built within his environment for a pretty long time before he took these steps. Now let me introduce you to the second thing that I want to share, the next thing I want to share with you. And then please uh, take a note of these Orthodox Christians and tell me if you see something interesting. I've been using a professional lawn service, but it just hasn't been worth it. So that's why I switched to Sunday. They know exactly what you need based on your address. Send it to you right when you need it. Sunday uses ingredients like seaweed, molasses, soy protein, all ingredients you can... It's the first week of a new year, and Russians are immersed in their Christmas spirit. Decorating the Christmas tree for the new year and Christmas is a totally magical time, and you're waiting for a miracle to happen. Christmas actually brings people together. On the streets of Moscow and in churches, people are... Now notice these women, they cover their heads. And you'll see the religious ones are covering and the not so one religious ones are not covering, as you'll see. Openly celebrating Russian Orthodox Christmas. It's a seismic change considering that 25 years ago, before the disintegration of the Soviet Union, attending a Bible study class could result in a jail sentence. From the establishment of the Soviet Union in 1922, communist leaders sought to eradicate religion. Churches were destroyed and the faithful were watched and persecuted. Today's conditions for the church over Russia's 1,000 year long history are the most favorable. I think this is the main feature of freedom in life. A man doesn't need to hide his religious beliefs. President Vladimir Putin has embraced his faith, routinely appearing at Christmas and other religious services. Analysts say he's used the Russian Orthodox Church to promote a so-called pivot to traditional values. But even as the church's status has risen, Putin has sought to ensure it remains subservient to the state. We can see understandable contradiction between uh, the interests of the church and the interests of the state like in case of Crimea. The contradiction is connected to the fact that Russian Orthodox Church is not only about Russia, it's about a much bigger space, including Ukraine. If the Russian Orthodox Church is enjoying a kind of renaissance... I'm going to talk about this when we get there. Now, also watch this. Now, what is Putin doing with the Orthodox Church? He is creating a power of Orthodox churches. And I'm gonna talk about this in detail, but let's first watch this video. With its golden domes and towering white walls, the Trinity Monastery of St. Sergius is the spiritual home of Orthodox Russian Christianity. Millions of tourists snake their way inside the complex each year, but the monastery could soon engulf much of the surrounding town of Sergiev Prosad. The town's mayor and church officials want to spend $2.2 billion restructuring the area into the heart of the Russian Orthodox Church. Locals are divided on the ambitious plan. 
God is with us. God is everywhere. We're all for it. Let the money come. It's not that much money. And it's worth it. We have many needy people that they could give that money to or build good roads or homes like the ones we used to get for free. They could spend money on that. I don't think that it's a great idea by our government. The Kremlin will provide at least 90 percent of the funding. With increasing support from the state, on average, three new churches are opening in Russia every day. Russia's okay, so this is historical. I, I hope you understand this. Three new churches opening up in Russia every day. Three new churches. Op like, imagine a, a, a situation, a revival of Islam, where it used to be communism, and now they're opening up three masjids a day. Like, what would that look like, right? So, but it's more than that because politics is involved and a lot of other things are involved that relate to Constant Constantinople, which I'm going to talk about. But first, you have to kind of understand what's happening. The statesmanship of Russia and then what's happening on the ground religiously, spiritually, and how does all of that relate to the plan of Allah? Okay. This Orthodox Church has rarely had such a bright future, but there are politics at play here too. A strong church supports a strong Russian state, and that's good news for President Vladimir Putin. While Pope Francis is seen by many as embracing liberalism, President Putin has championed the social conservatism of the Orthodox Church to solidify... So here you get it. Now, this is one thing that is probably going to happen as the economic situation gets bad, atheism start, starts to subside, the Roman Catholic Church becomes more and more powerful in the hearts of the people versus the Orthodox Church becoming already more and more powerful in the East. So there will be a rivalry, and there is a rivalry between the Romans and the Orthodox. And this will become more clear. And then now, how does Ukraine play into all of this? I'm going to touch on that. But I want you to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is playing a plan here. And the plan is partly to wake Muslims up. But the other part of the plan is to help the Muslims because they are not able to help themselves. Just like as an example, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu at one time was given help by his uncle Abu Talib. The Prophet loved him. The Prophet cared for him. The Prophet would, you know, he, he had tremendous feelings of love for him, regardless of being Muslim, non-Muslim. But Allah used him for his Prophet. So the same way Allah can use anyone for Islam. In fact, uh, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, In Allah, you call you have a deen, be Rajulun Fajr, O Kamakan, call an Abi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah will help this deen even by a Fajr man, even by an un, uh, you, if you say, you know, uh, Russia is very bad, and let's say they're the worst people, and Putin is the worst people, and he's doing this for politics, and he's just being conservative for the sake of, fine. But Allah can use anyone for his deen. Okay. So now, let's go to the next part of this conversation. So you have these two big churches, the Orthodox and the Romans. Now, let's look at a few things about the Orthodox Christianity so that you kind of get a better picture of what is going on. Uh, let's see if I get this. If not, then I will. The Orthodox Church split from its Russian counterpart in 2018. Now, let me explain this a little bit. The, the church in Kremlin, the, the main church of the Orthodox in that area is in <coughs> in, in Moscow. The leader of Moscow appoints the priests in Ukraine. Even now. But people in 
Ukraine started to say, well, maybe that's not a good idea. Well, there's a rivalry going on within the Christian Orthodox churches. And the rivalry is becoming threatening to the Orthodox Christians. And this is the, I'm going to come to that as soon as I can. Let me actually uh, go over this first. The split in Ukraine's Orthodox Church, okay? Uh, the decision was approved by the Patriarch of Constantinople, the symbolic first among equals of the world's Orthodox churches, triggered a major fallout within the Orthodox world, possibly the most serious in a thousand years. The same month, a declaration was made. The Russian Orthodox Church announced that it would break off relations with the, uh, I don't know how to say that word, okay? But this whole thing, so how did it come about? And this goes over the history of the different Orthodox churches and how they broke from one another. But here's what the end result is. I'm not going to read the whole article. The end result is this, is that there are two sides to this, the church and the politics. The bigger the Orthodox church, the bigger Putin's base of strength. Okay. That's clear, right? The bigger the, the bigger the Orthodox Church. So one of the main Orthodox churches is in Ukraine. And those Orthodox churches, okay, they have been pondering and thinking about separating from Russia. Because Rus the Russian Orthodox churches control the Ukraine Orthodox churches, the biggest ones. So if now they're a separate country, many people are talking about cutting off the church. Well, Putin always saw the church, just like Trump did in the United States, Putin always saw the church as a way of influencing himself outside the borders of Russia to other parts because of his relationship with the Orthodox Church. But the, some of the Orthodox churches have always wanted to break away from Russia. Now, that's the political side. The religious side is that the more the church breaks, the stronger the Roman Catholics get. And the church has always believed in what they call unification. They've always believed in this. They always believe that we should have one church. And Muslims have the same attitude. So the Christians have the same attitude. There should be one church. Why create 10 masjids when there can be one big one and everyone can be unified? They have the same idea. And so the church feels that if the Orthodox church gets smaller and smaller, there is a movement amongst Christians and a movement that has caught fire amongst the Orthodox Christians. Unless they do something, it's going to dwindle and dwindle away the power of the Orthodox church and thus the base that Putin is standing on. So what is that? Let me share that with you. So you can also see this title here, why church conflict in Ukraine reflects historic Russian Ukrainian tensions. Putin wants God or at least church on his side Um, I will share this with you. This you'll find interesting. In Russia, from 1988 to 2016, you can see how the numbers of priests have increased, how the monasteries, almost a thousand monasteries now, compared to 22 in 1988, parishes, bishops, you know, dioceses, they've all increased, okay? Because there's a, why have it increased? It's increased because religious needs are more. Obviously, three churches a day, even 35,000 priests is really not enough. So I'll just read this paragraph from here. The idea was the Soviet state collapsed 
we think it was a geopolitical catastrophe. But look, the church is still there. Like I said yesterday, if everything collapses, what will people resort to for unity, for coherence, for society? If everything collapses, everyone's going to resort to the religion. And this is what kept Soviet Union together or kept Russia together because they were hoping that when it would fall, it would fall completely. They didn't anticipate on the church playing such a big role on keeping everything unified. And hence, you can now maybe appreciate the verse of the Quran a little bit more that talks about that if the mosques and the churches and the synagogues would be destroyed, there would be chaos in the world because these inst religious institutions are the only thing left when everything else breaks. Okay, so the idea of the Soviet state collapsed, we think it was geopolitical catastrophe, but look, the church is still there. A former editor of Moscow's uh, magazine who was fired in 2015 for criticizing the church's leadership. That's why the patriarch here in Moscow isn't just the patriarch in Russia, but the whole post-Soviet space as well. And obviously this meant a lot to Kremlin. So what you're understanding here is that the church exerted influence on all the Christians of the entire region, regardless of Russia. But now what does Russia want? Russia wants to keep the Orthodox Church united. Putin wants to keep the Orthodox Christians united because if they don't, then I'm gonna show you something that is of a great threat to the Orthodox Christianity is uh, something that the Roman Church has started, the Protestants started, which is swaying Orthodox people away, okay? Which I will share with you inshallah here in a second, as soon as it comes up. We're not going to talk about Hagia Sophia, but obviously, if you're trying to unite all the uh, all the Orthodox churches, it has to end in a series of uniting from one country to another country to, in the end, getting Hagia Sophia, okay? Or trying to negotiate something regarding Hagia Sophia. So this is just the natural way things will go because of this threat that they have okay so um this is a whole article that basically talks about orthodoxy orthodox unity today uh basically look the idea is uh, what does unity mean for orthodox people that's a conversation that they're having but uh there is a great threat to this uh this uh, unity and that threat when it when that is this it's called Ecumenism, ecumenism, okay? Ecumenism is the idea that it doesn't matter what church you belong to, be Roman Catholic or any other group or this group or that group. And if I had time, I would go into the details because they have a very, they have the Orthodox church has a very, like, a, you know how in Islam we have a Isnad based teaching, like who's your teacher and who's your teacher's teacher and who's your teacher's teacher, like very Asnad based, very like, you have to be legit and you have to be approved and you have to have ijaza. In the same way, they have a system. You can't just become a priest and open up a church, okay? You have to go to their asnad system to do things, their, their system that they have in place. Well, this, uh, the movement of, of is, what is it doing? It's saying, oh, as long as you're Christian, as long as you don't have to follow everything, you just follow some of it. This idea of liberalism, and then within the churches, the idea of, I don't know how to say this word again, uh, this movement that says, hey, as long as we're okay, we have some things in common, it's good enough. This is going to water down the true teachings in their eyes of the Orthodox Church. So now there's only, and, and these, this threat is a big threat because they see the Roman Catholic Church as literally the devil, okay? And they see that as a big devil. And in fact, you know, um, they would rather see us closer to themselves, the Orthodox Christians, because these Orthodox Christians, now you see their women in hijab, when they say Muslim women in hijab, they have a certain affinity 
that they feel towards Muslims because of the commonness, it's easier for them to understand the message of Islam. And it's easier for them to appreciate the Islamic message compared to those Christian women when they look at that don't, that think this is backward. So I hope you're getting the point here. Okay, so... Okay, let, hold on one second. Let me allow somebody in. Okay. So, ecumenism is a great threat to, and, and this whole article here is basically about this whole issue about, you know, the church is one, but we can't, and, you know, this is the work of the Antichrist, and, and he goes on to all of these uh, different things. Okay. Chechnyan experience of combat in Syria. Uh, I won't go over that yet. I talked about this. I talked about this. Uh, now I want to talk about this. So now Turkey is in a very difficult situation. Why is Turkey in a very difficult situation? Turkey is in a difficult situation because Erdogan has sided with NATO. And essentially, that means Erdogan has sided with the Catholic Church from a Orthodox Christian perspective. Okay. And Erdogan tells Putin uh, uh, tells Putin won't accept moves on Ukraine's sovereignty. So Erdogan is in a difficult situation. To, Turkey supports Ukraine's right to fight, to defend its territorial integrity, Erdogan. Turkey to continue to support Ukraine's territorial integrity and unity. I talked about this. So now you see the picture. If Turkey takes the side of NATO, they'll be making a huge mistake. And they will put themselves in great danger. Because Allah has already hinted at who's going to win. But more than that, whatever decision Turkey makes will impact the future in this issue. They're asking Turkey to close the seas and the gateways. And I, I think they have, they're, they're in the process of doing that. And Turkey, in fact, stood up and criticized NATO that you weren't able to do anything other than give advice and make some statements. America is helpless. Europe is helpless because of the energy crisis. And so Erdogan is angry that they didn't do anything. Strange. So... What is my point here? My point here is that when the Quran is giving us guidance on which people you befriend and which people you stay away from, you don't befriend the people who made an alliance with the Judeo-Christian civilization. That's the wrong side. Those that say we are helpers of God, we are Nasara, those that say we're Nazirin, those that say that have the monks, as we saw the number of monks increasing, those that have the uh, humble attitude. And now, and, 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 and so when you look at this, if Turkey takes the side of NATO, it will be it will have negative consequences. And so now we talk about the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in which the Prophet mentioned how Kustantunia will have, will be invaded. Who is going to invade Constantinople? I don't know. Will it be the NATO side or will it be the Orthodox Christians? I don't know that yet. But what I do know is that if Turkey makes the wrong decisions, then it will have consequences. And it seems to me 
Turkey is either being forced or is going to make or wants to make the wrong decisions because it wants to be part of EU, it wants to be part of NATO, it wants to be part of that alliance, rather than understanding where their true friendship would be. Because they, you know how for how long Turkey has been begging NATO and EU, please let us be part of European Union, please let us be part of European Union, please let us be part of European Union. And you see how Putin, for example, is treating the Muslims. When Khabib won, you remember all of you, when Khabib won, how uh, the Putin, he went to, uh, you know, uh, Khabib's house, he met with him and his dad, respected him. This is the, this type of respect, France and Germany and England and these countries, they're never going to give the Muslims, never. He made a Muslim head of the, in charge of the main operations of his military. Do you expect America to do, ever do that? Do you expect England to ever do that? Do you expect Germany to ever do that? This is the difference. So you, this is why the Quranic guidance is so important. This is why Quranic guidance is so important, that without the Quranic guidance, these things would be hard to figure out. Quran points you in the right direction. You do a little bit of research. It makes sense to you. You add one plus one is equal to two. And you say, okay, this is what we should be doing. Quran is a book of guidance. And then, now let me end by this conversation that I wanted to have. And inshallah, we'll be done for today. Not like yesterday, three hours. I, you know, I was like surprised at that. So now let me share with you this. Hello, Masanila Muhammad. Okay. Now let us look at. Prophet Muhammad's attitude towards the Christians. And I'm only going to give some examples. I'm going to do another video because there's about six documents, but we're going to look at uh, maybe one or two right now and uh, then call it a day, inshallah. Ta'ala. For those of you who have been listening to this from the beginning, I hope, inshallah, it is now clear to you that the sunnah of Allah and how Allah makes things work. Now, uh, I'll just read this. The most famous prophet's covenant is the one that exists in the St. Catherine's monastery, <coughs> and of which we have numerous copies. More importantly, this copy was recorded. You know, even the, the Sultan of uh, the Ottomans, they kept this and so on and so forth. So I'm going to read to you the prophet's covenant with the monks of Mount Sinai. Okay, we have the original copy of that. Uh, I can show that to you maybe at the end of this discussion. It's at the top. Prophet Muhammad's covenant with the monks of Mount Sinai. So this is now the prophetic method of making treaties with non-Muslims and how to treat non-Muslims. This writ is written by Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. And who's writing this? Ali radiallahu anh, is the one who actually wrote it, but the prophet dictated it. The, this writ is written by Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the proclaimer and warner trusted to protect God's creation in order that people may raise no claim against God after the advent of his messenger, uh, for God is almighty, all wise. It has been written for those who profess Christianity as their creed in East or West, far or near, Arab or non-Arab, known or unknown, as the covenant of protection. If anyone breaks the covenant herein, proclaimed or contravenes or transgresses its commands. He has broken the covenant of God, breaks his bond, makes a mockery of his religion. Meaning if you, if you treat non-Muslims, and there's a say hadith and say Muslim about this, the prophet said, I will stand with the vimmi, with the non-Muslim on the day of judgment against the Muslim. Okay. So you will be making a mockery of your deen. If you use your deen to oppress non-Muslims, makes a mockery of his religion, 
deserves the curse of God, meaning it's a kabair, it's amongst the big sins, whether he is a sultan or another among the believing Muslims. And many, many sultans treated non-Muslims, especially Orthodox Christians, very badly. And it is not by chance that the Prophet may have written that. If a monk or a pilgrim seeks protection in a mountain or valley or in a cave or in tilted fields, in the plain or in the desert or in a church, I am behind them, defending them from every enemy. I, my helpers, all members of my religion, all my followers, meaning you and me, for they, the monks and the pilgrims, are subject and under my protection. I will remove from them all mischief which subjects have to bear of supplies, which they give as loan goods from their land taxes to their rulers, except for what they voluntarily consent. So even the jizya is based upon what they agree to give. And then jizya money is used for them, for their court systems. So they have divorce issues amongst themselves. They have whatever issues they, the, it's to appoint the judge for the jizya money is used for the minorities. There shall be no compulsion or constraint against them in any of these matters. And this is the thing about the Prophet ﷺ, right? He is this master creation of Allah. That on the one hand, right, he's telling people, you know, prophetic grappling, learn grappling, learn fighting, learn archery. Uh, he's the warrior. But he also has a heart. And he also knows what people need. And... So you will see that in these writings, that, that side of his rahmah, you can say, of the Prophet A bishop shall not be removed from his bishop uh, uh, position, nor a monk from his monastery, nor a hermit from his tower, nor shall a pilgrim be hindered from his pilgrimage. Moreover, no building from among their churches shall be destroyed, nor shall the money of their churches be used for building mosques or houses for the Muslims. Whoever does such a thing violates the covenant of God and his messenger. Neither tribute nor fees shall be laid on monks, bishops, and worshippers, for I protect them wherever they may be, on land or sea, in east or west, in north or south. They are under my protection, within my covenant, and in my security against all harm. Those who isolate themselves in the mountains or in sacred sites shall be also free from any tribute and land taxes. They shall not be obliged to provide from what they have cultivated any land taxes or tilt. What they cultivate should not be taken from them and should be kept for their own consumption. They shall be assisted in times of hardship by being granted an allowance of one unit of dry measure that is enough for each person residing in their mon monastic community. They shall not be obliged to serve in war, nor pay the tribute, even those for whom an obligation to pay land taxes exists, or who possess resources in land or from commercial activity, they shall not have to pay more than 12 dirhams per head per year. This, by the way, statement comes in a lot of these covenants, 12 uh, dirhams per head, per year. Like, no one shall be, shall, no, no one shall an unjust tax be imposed. And with the people of the book, there's no strife. They should be spoken um, they should be spoken to in the kindest ways. We wish to take them under the wing of our mercy and the penalty of vexation shall be kept at a distance from them, wherever they are and wherever they may settle. Now it should be of no surprise to you with this concern of the prophet, why Omar, when he's in the masjid in Jerusalem and says, I'm not gonna pray in this church. I'm gonna pray outside this because I don't want Muslims to take over this church. Uh, so, yeah, I don't want the Muslims to take, this was the concern for the non-Muslims, the Muslims had. Right? This is what it means to be that the imam of the people, right? To be leaders of the people, meaning all people, Muslims, non-Muslims. The Prophet was a leader for all. He was a mercy for all.
If a Christian woman enters a Muslim household, she shall be received with kindness. She shall be given the opportunity to pray in her church. Her husband shall never intervene between her and her religion. Whoever contravenes the covenant of God and acts to the contrary is a rebel against the covenant and his, and his, his covenant and his messenger. Meaning your bayah with the prophet would be broken. These people shall be assisted in maintenance of their religious buildings. Meaning a Muslim is spending his money or the Muslim khilafah is spending their money on maintaining their churches. Thus, they will abide in, uh, be aided in their faith and ke kept true to their allegiance. None of them shall be compelled to bear arms, but the Muslims shall defend them and they shall never contravene this promise of protection until the hour rises and the world comes to an end. So after the Prophet passed away, his successor, the second commander of the faithful Omar, followed the example of the Prophet and gave a covenant to the Christians of Jerusalem as follows. Uh, I don't know if I want to read this one too. There are six of them that are very famous. Um, I'll read this one uh, quickly and then I'll take some questions and we'll call it, you know, I'll say some ending words and take some questions and then we'll call it a day for today. Praise be to God who has honored us with Islam, blessed us with faith, sent his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a mercy unto us. And through him, we were guided out of error. Our hearts softened, our hearts softened our hearts softened towards one another and we became united as dear brothers, even though we were disunited. And he made us victorious over our enemies and established us in the land. Praise God, O servants of God, for this indeed is a blessing for which he has given you. This is the writ, meaning the document, which Omar bin Khattab gives as a covenant and as a pledge to the revered and respected patriarch. Uh, it's hard for me to say these words but at the Mount Olives in Jerusalem and what comprised thereof of his subjects, priests, monks, and nuns. They all have an assurance of safety wherever they may be and wherever they may find themselves. If a protected person keeps to his religious obligations, then it is binding upon us, the believers. And now notice, if a protected person keeps to his religious obligations, meaning the Christian obligation or a Jewish obligation, then it is binding upon us, the believers, and those who will succeed us to grant him protection and security so he does not ever assert that he was compelled to forsake his religion because he was subject to Muslim rule. The Christians have been granted protection for their churches, monasteries, pilgrimage sites inside and out Jerusalem, those being the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Church of Na Nativity, along with its uh, grotto and its three doors, the eastern, north, western ones, for it is there in Bethlehem that Jesus, peace be upon him, was born. All Christians of different ethnicities who reside in these areas have our protection, including the Christians from the Caucasus, the Christians from the Caucasus lands. Now notice here what is interesting, the Umar radiallahu anh, one of the covenants that we have is the one Ali wrote to the Armenians. We're not going to go over that today. But the Caucasus and the Christians, of the, that's where is who? That's where the Orthodox Christians are. And so Omar is pointing out to them specifically. So, um, you know, anyway. Those Christians who come from the Caucasus lands and from the Abyssinia. Abyssinia is another place, right? Those Christians who come for pilgrim from among the Franks, the Copts. Now, Franks is Europe proper, what we call East Western Europe. This is French, the Franks, the Coptics, the Egyptians, the Syriacs, the Armenians, the Nestorians, the Jacobites, the Mennonites, all of whom fall under the patronage and the aforementioned patriarch also have our protection. The patriarch will act as a representative because the blessed, honorable, and the beloved prophet sent by God honored them with his seal, which he gave to them using his blessed hand, which I will show you. And then he commanded that they be looked after and protected. It is for this reason that we believers conduct ourselves righteously today to those who treated them nobly in the past, they have been exempted from tribute and all burdensome obligations. They will be protected from all harm, whether they be on land or sea. 
when, whenever they enter the church of Holy Sepulchre or whichever pilgrimage site they choose to visit, none shall be taken away from them. As for those Christians from outside Jerusalem and Bethlehem who make pilgrimage to the church of Holy Sepulchre, they will give the patriarch one dirham and a third in silver. Okay, so this is to their own. Even Every believing man and woman, regardless of whether they are rich or poor, has the duty to carry out this warrant, which every sultan, ruler, governor, exercising his rule on earth needs to abide by. This being an obligation on all Muslims and believing men and women, when this decree of ours was issued in the presence of a large group of honorable companions, Abdullah, Uthman bin Affan, uh, uh, and then he mentions uh, the other companions of the Prophet. May God Most High send his blessings and salutations upon our master Muhammad, his family, and his companions. Praise be to God, Lord of the worlds. Allah is sufficient for us. He is the best of guardians. It is the writ on the 20th of Raj, uh, Rabiul Awal, on the 15th of the Prophet's Hijrah. Whoever of the believers has read this decree opposes it from now until the day of judgment, then he's broken the covenant of God and has been, has been disavowed by the noble messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa Okay, so now uh, let me show you this. This is a copy of one of them that is one of the famous ones, okay? And it even has uh, a seal bearing his entire hand on both, you know, uh, these are, and this is what the Ottoman Empire also enforced, okay? So what do we learn in all of this? What we learn in all of this is that when we look at the situation before us, we can see that the obligation of the Muslims towards those people that are becoming true to their own deen, true to their own deen, when Christians are becoming more Christians or when Jews are becoming more Jews, just like the verse of the Quran, Ya Ahl al Kitab, O people of the book, Lastum ala shay, you have no claim. Wal -injil, until you establish what is in Torah and Injil. If you don't want to be Muslim, we're not going to force you, but then follow your deen according to your deen. And this was the prophetic method. As long as you're doing that, we will support you against the Satanists and the Dajjali forces. That is the Islamic stance. And this is what people are not getting. That on the one side, though they not be Muslim, they're trying to establish their deen as best as they can. And on the other side, you have this Catholic church that's opening out to gays and lesbians and all other genders and liberalizing religiousness and breaking all the covenants, all the commands. and uh, is a force of complete evil. And so, hold on one second. And number two, whether we Muslims take the right side or we take the wrong side, whether we, it's of course advisable that every Muslim should consider a relationship with, every Muslim country should consider its relationship with all the satans, number one, especially that region, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Chechnya, all these areas, this whole Turkmenistan, okay? And number two, should consider its relationship with these Christian groups that are becoming more Christian. That, yes, and that means that because they're becoming more Christians, they want a Christian empire. They want to expand the Orthodox Church's influence and if Muslims don't know how to negotiate and don't know how to talk, and if they side with the wrong people, then it will have dire consequences. Okay. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make his plan come about. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help the Muslims by non-Muslims. But Allah also told us, who are the people that you're not going to get help from? And it is those people that we're not going to get help from that we're doing sujood to them. 
And those people that are willing to treat us with respect and honor and dignity, like they did with Khabib and this general, we're not willing to sit on the table with them. That is the situation the Muslims are in today. So I will open up the uh, I will open up the forum uh, for maybe one or two questions. I think we could take questions uh, maybe for 10 minutes. And then after that, I have to go. So if there's any questions, uh, I will take the questions, inshallah. Uh, yes, brother. Uh, I think brother Hussein had his hand up first. Okay, Brother Muhammad Ali. We can't speak. Okay, let me see what I can do that. Uh, enable. Okay. Does anyone know how to turn it on? Let me see now. Okay, try now. Uh, Brother Muhammad Ali, try now. No. Okay, let's try this. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, alaikum assalam. You hear me? Yes, Ben. Yeah. Uh, uh, very wonderful facts and information that you offer about the subjects. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yes, Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Sheikh, is there any way that we can get hold of the the covenants of Rasulullah so that we can study them? Because there's a lot of information, and it needs it, it, to go over it a bit by bit by bit again. Yeah. So, anything uh, there, or anything, or a book, or something. Yes, there is uh, a few books on the subject. Uh, let me see. In English, in English Sheikh. Yeah, in English, there's translations of it, and I can tell you that one you send it? it's called this. Unfortunately, my Kindle is all broken. So, what does it say? It's lights shining on it, Sheikh. Is it? Okay, so it says uh, the book is called. Uh, This, it's called Six Covenants of Prophet Muhammad with Christians of his time. The primary documents. Who is it by Sheikh? Is it got an, uh, an... Uh, Muhammad bin uh, Abdullah. Muhammad bin Abdullah. Yeah. Let's pick it up together right over here. Because uh, these are really, I do want to do a, a YouTube video at some point on these documents itself because there's a lot of interesting information. Now, I will mention some fiqhi issues, which I didn't mention, because these documents are written in a different context, and Islamic law was developed in a different context, so I'm going to explain a few things, so that people are not confused. So, uh, but, uh, covenant... So this is the book. Okay. And now, uh, let me, I forgot to mention, there's a difference of opinion in the, amongst the fuqaha. Uh, there's some things that need to be clarified so that there's no... Uh, 
the rules in these treaties don't apply if they attack you or they rebel against you. Then the rules are the ones that I talked about when I a while ago talked about uh, Hagia Sophia and how it was captured and what were the proper rules versus the improper. I talked about that in detail, looking at traditional sources in our uh, Islamic books uh, on, uh, on in, in that situation. Okay, but this is if you go in peace, they accept like in Jerusalem, Omar went in peace then this is the type of covenant where it's completely like open and completely there's no obligation. But then if you don't go in peace for security purposes, certain things need to be done like, uh, in the time of threat or in the time of war. Non-Muslims may be asked to wear certain clothing so they can be identified. So the Fulkaha, they have this. It was done more, you can say, out of practicality of situation. But the spirit, the original spirit, the one that the prophet says is forever, not, is this. But if because there's threats and security, and then you can add on rules that the companions added on just to protect themselves. Uh, yes. Uh, Brother Hussein? Yes. Uh, 